So our theme has been the truth will set you free and we've looked at this sixfold freedom. First of freedom from sin, Jesus came to set us free from sin. How do we get free? By knowing the truth that Jesus died to take away, to take the punishment of our sin and that through the power of his Holy Spirit and his grace we can overcome the power of sin. We can be set free from that cage. We saw that Jesus came to set us free from a legalistic spirit towards obeying his commandments. Obeying his commandments is right but you got to obey it in the right spirit. Otherwise it's a dead work. You can do the right thing with the wrong spirit and it becomes a dead work even though it's a right thing. So Jesus came to set us free from that legalistic spirit with which we try to please God. And um, he came to set us free from that. And then we saw in our last study, he came to set us free from the world, this world system. And it's when we know the truth about this world system, like we heard in the last session, and the who runs this world system, that our eyes are open and say, hey, I'm probably mingling up with the wrong type of company, with Satan. Then I want to break free from it and I seek for the power of the Holy Spirit to change my way of thinking so that the world doesn't grip me inside and then it will not affect my outward life either. Okay, now we want to look at another cage in which a lot of believers are trapped, which Jesus came to set us free from. And I want to turn first of all to Hebrews in chapter 2. Jesus came to deliver us from fear. Fear is a very strong cage in which many, many believers are trapped so that they cannot fly like the eagle. So our subject today is freedom from fear. Hebrews chapter 2 and we read there in verse 14 and 15. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, so that through death he might render powerless the one who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might set free or deliver those who through fear, through fear, the fear of death, were slaves all their lives. He came to set people free who were enslaved by fear. Here he mentions the fear of death. The fear of death is the greatest fear. We can say number one among all fears. But underneath that are many, many, many other fears. And we can be trapped in any one of these fears. The Bible says in Proverbs and chapter 29, Proverbs chapter 29, it says, in verse 25, the fear of man is a trap, it's a snare, it's a cage. Fear of human opinion, it's a cage, but the one who trusts in the Lord will be exalted means he'll be, he'll fly like the eagle. So there are two things put in opposition to each other in this verse. One is fear and the other is faith. The one who fears is put in a trap. The one who has faith 
gets exalted like the eagle flies in the sky fear and faith are opposites you can't have both in your heart like you can't have Christ and a demon in your heart at the same time you make a choice you either have a demon or you have Christ if you have Christ you don't have the demon if you have a demon you don't have Christ it's like that you either have faith or you have fear you cannot have both and sometimes you may think well I have faith but I'm also scared no you're fooling yourself when you have fear you don't have faith no you don't you you got to face up to it and say I don't have faith it's when the devil fools you to make you think yeah you got both it's like these people who say that you can have Christ and a demon sitting inside your heart coexisting and fellowshipping with each other fear and faith cannot fellowship with each other you have one or the other fear comes in faith goes out faith comes in fear goes out so this is a very gripping thing fear I want you to turn to John's Gospel chapter 20 it says here in John chapter 20 that after all the wonderful messages that they had heard from Jesus the greatest preacher for three and a half years and the numerous times that he told them fear not fear not don't be afraid don't be afraid don't be afraid it says here that the when Jesus came John chapter 20 after his resurrection verse 19 it was evening on that first day of the week and when the doors were shut where the disciples were sitting because they were afraid of the Jews he came and said to them peace be with you and he showed them his hands and his feet and his side rather and they rejoiced they said this is great he is risen and he said peace be to you I, as the father sent me so send I you and he breathed on them and said receive the Holy Spirit similar to our being born again they were not filled with the Holy Spirit they were born again we can say and then a few days later eight days later eight days after this happened verse 26 his disciples were again inside the closed door for fear and Jesus came the doors were again shut see even though Jesus said all this they saw the risen Lord uh, they rejoiced Jesus breathed on them but they were still afraid it didn't deliver them from fear exactly like your experience and mine how many of you believe that Jesus rose from the dead all of us how many of you rejoice that Jesus rose from the dead all of us born again most of us are born again but fear is still there these disciples were like that what was it that made them throw the doors open a few days later when they were filled with the Holy Spirit that drove out fear and after that this same man Peter who was afraid to witness to a small servant girl suddenly he becomes a bold man and stands before the chief priests and others and say you crucified Christ how did he get that boldness was it a gradual therapy psychological therapy that delivered him from fear over a period of six months no it had nothing to do with psychology did somebody give him a pep talk sometimes you know we come to a meeting Sunday meeting and uh, the way you receive the message is like a pep talk you know like a coach gives a pep talk to a football team before it goes on the field come on stirs them all up to go and score goals we get a pep talk on Sunday and we say yeah I'm bold now and by the time the effect of that pep talk wears out by Monday we are back inside the closed doors again we need something more than a pep talk the disciples didn't get a pep talk they were filled with the Holy Spirit and that drove out all fear from them 
And as long as they continued being filled with the Spirit, fear would go. But we read in the Acts of the Apostles, a few days later, after the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 4, it says, the people began to threaten the apostles, saying, we'll kill you. And so they did the sensible thing, they prayed. And they prayed to the Lord in Acts 4.29 and said, Now Lord, take note of their threats and give your servants boldness, fearless confidence to preach your word. They, they said, Lord, these people are threatening us. And to tell you honestly, Lord, we are a bit scared. Please deliver us once again from this fear. We don't want to live scared lives. You know, it's good to be honest. Uh, maybe you were baptized in the Holy Spirit, but you're scared again. Go to the Lord and say, Lord, I tell you honestly, I'm a bit scared about this situation. But will you please fill me once again? And it says, verse 31, the last part, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they got bold again. Isn't that great? That we can go to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm a bit scared and the Lord fills me with the Holy Spirit and my boldness comes back again. We need it more than once. There is no once for all experience that will deliver us from fear forever. No. You get out of the cage and then something else puts you back inside the cage again. And you say, Lord, liberate me. This is not the place where I'm supposed to live. I mean, I need to constantly go to God and say, Lord, I never want to live inside this cage of fear. Now, there is a difference between being afraid and being cautious. For example, if I'm working with an electrical wire or a plug point or something, opening it out and screwing it up and all that, I won't be afraid, but I'll be very cautious. I'll make sure I'm wearing rubber slippers and, you know, use screwdrivers that don't conduct electricity, etc. That's, that's not fear, that's caution. If I'm going through a forest infested with snakes, I won't be afraid, but I'll be cautious. I'll carry a torchlight, I'll carry a stick or something to keep me. And if I don't need to go through it, I won't go through it. That's, that's not fear, that's caution. We must not be foolish and mistake caution for fear. I mean, if somebody's going, you hear that uh, there's a lion that got loose from Banner Gutta or somewhere is roaming the streets. Well, I'm not going to walk in front of that and say, listen, I'm not afraid of you. I just going to be cautious uh, because I don't want to lose my life. <laughs> and um, I mean, Jesus was like that. Have you ever read this verse? John chapter 7. John chapter 7, verse 1. After these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee. And he was not willing to walk in Judea. Because the Jews were trying to kill him. You ask the Lord, Lord, why don't you go to Judea? Hey, those guys are trying to kill me there. Why should I go there? Now you'd preach to Jesus. Hey, come on, Lord, don't be scared. Don't you know that your life is in your father's hand and nobody can touch you till... Come on, go there. That would be like the devil tempting him to jump off the temple. Come on, jump off the temple. The Lord will protect you. That is stupidity. And he will turn around to you and say, and get behind me, Satan, and you deserve to hear it. Because that's stupidity. You know, to go and try to show off that my life is in God's hands and nobody can kill me. Even Jesus, the Son of God, he did not go to certain places because you know, they're trying to kill you there. Why should you go there? And you know the advice he gave to his disciples in Matthew chapter 10? I mean, I say this, I mean, these are obvious things, but some people are pretty foolish. In Matthew chapter 10, he said in verse 23, when they persecute you in one city, run. <laughs> run, why? <laughs> because I don't want to die. <laughs> Did Je you know Jesus told you to run when they persecute you? Please remember that when that time comes. Run to another place where there's no persecution. You see, 
Faith does not mean we don't use our common sense. That is the stupidity of so many believers. That faith means, oh, I don't run. God will protect me. I'll go there where they're going to kill me. Nothing will happen. It's like these people who won't take medicine when they're sick. No, God will take care of me. Stupidity. There are lots of cases like that we've seen in India of people who were taught by pastors who never studied the word of God properly and there are people who have died before their time who could have I've seen it here in Bangalore young people who have died before their time because they were taught not to take medicine and you know what happens to these pastors when they get old and they get sick they take medicines and they say well I changed my mind on it now you change your mind after killing so many people with the false doctrine don't be deceived by all this it's happening it's happening around our country with stupid Christians who haven't studied the Word of God don't be fooled by all that that's not boldness that's not faith we got to be cautious there is no virtue in jumping off the temple and saying the Lord will protect me when God has provided stairs use the stairs when God has provided medicine use the medicine if I were in some jungle where I couldn't use medicine but nothing was available, I will trust the Lord to heal me. Sure. But where God has provided means, where He's provided the stairs to jump down and say, God is going to take care of me, is the height of stupidity. So, I mentioned that, that caution is different from fear. Jesus was cautious and He told us to be cautious. So don't mistake the two. But fear is not from God. See, 2 Timothy chapter 1 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7 God has not given us the spirit of fear or timidity timidity is also fear it's a form of fear I'm afraid to step out when God tells me to do something timid you know there's a verse in Corinthians which says act like men that means don't be effeminate God I mean it's alright for a woman to be a woman but I tell you I have seen a number of men who behave like women and that's wrong you know they're, they're, they won't dress like women because they say oh the Bible says don't dress like a woman but if you behave like a woman it's worse I'd rather dress like a woman than behave like a woman any day Of course, I don't want to do either but if I have a choice, <laughs> uh, dressing like a woman is not as bad as behaving like a woman, you men. I tell you, I've seen people like that who are so timid and effeminate. God wants us to be bold. And I believe the reason why there's a lot, lack of leadership coming up in our churches in the next generation is because we've got a bunch of young men who are effeminate. They're acting like women. Women are not supposed to be leaders. The Bible is not given. Uh, that doesn't mean they are inferior. Don't get that idea. Supposing I tell you men, none of you can give birth to a baby. Does that make you inferior? I tell you, you can pray as much as you like. You'll never be able to give birth to a baby. That doesn't make you inferior. A woman is not superior because she gives birth to a baby. That's what they're equipped for. And in the same way, a man is equipped to be the leader. It's just like that. They've got one gift, you've got another gift. Now, I'm just quoting scripture. <laughs> Don't think I'm just spinning theories in my head. Uh, I'm quoting scripture exactly like it says. 1 Timothy chapter 2. A woman should not be a leader. Verse 12. But a woman, verse 12. 15 should give birth to babies you see what I said a woman should give birth to babies and a man should be the leader it's there in scripture so the example I quoted was right there from scripture that's their gift and this is your gift so just like women give birth to babies you be a leader why is it more of our men are not leaders why are they so timid why don't they Say, God, fill me with the Holy Spirit and help me to do something for you. 
I believe that. I mean, I started doing that when I was 21. I said, Lord, I want to serve you. And I'd look for opportunities to do something. I never got a chance to stand in pulpits like this because I was too young. I'd preach on the streets. I'd go to homes and talk to one or two people. I wanted to do something for God. I was not going to be a woman. And I want to say to all of you, do something for the Lord. Don't just sit at home like a woman and just say, I go to the meeting on Sunday. I go to the meeting on Wednesday. But the sisters also do that. And you go to the meeting and you just sit quietly there and you come home. The sisters also do that. You're a woman. Some of you brothers, you should put a scarf on your head when you come to the meeting. Because that's how you behave. Like a woman. Be honest. Put a scarf on your head and say, I'm a brother. I'm an effeminate um, but brother, please excuse me. I'll sit here with a scarf. Be honest. Don't be a hypocrite and uncover your head and say, I'm a man. You're not a man. You're a woman. I really believe it's the spirit of timidity and fear that keeps down a lot of our people from doing something for the Lord. I'm not asking you to give birth to babies, you brothers. I'm asking you to be leaders. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If a great and powerful, hairy, broad-chested, Fisherman like Peter could be scared of a young girl. I suppose you and I can also be scared. But he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then fear will go out. Timidity will go out. I believe many of us should take the lead. We should be afraid. We should get rid of, first of all, the fear of making mistakes. You know why you're afraid to make a mistake? Please listen carefully. Most of us are afraid of making mistakes publicly because, listen carefully, because you love the honor of men so much, you don't want them to see that you make a mistake. Supposing a little child never wanted anybody to see it falling down while it was trying to walk, one year old or 11 months old. <laughs> it will never learn to walk. But you learn a lesson from these little children. They try to walk when they are 10 months old and they collapse. And they try again, they fall. They try again, they fall. And one day, lo and behold, they are walking. They are not afraid of making mistakes. Don't be afraid of making a mistake. I have made a lot of stupid mistakes, but I learned a lot of things through them. But I believe we need to be delivered from this spirit of timidity and fear which keeps you inside a cage. Locked up. I can't do this. You know, very often you will discover that God gives you an enablement to do something when you step out and say, I'm going to do something for God. I believe we need to get out of this timidity. Very, very important. I'm speaking especially to brothers who all that you do is go to your meetings on Sunday or Wednesday, go to all the meetings regularly like all the sisters do and maybe get up and speak for two minutes and share something from the word in an effeminate way. When are we going to get out of this? When are we going to get the spirit of boldness? God has not given us the spirit of timidity or fear, but the spirit of power. And I believe we need that. Jesus, just like he said, sin not, sin not, sin not, don't sin. He told the woman caught in adultery, don't sin again. He told other people, don't sin again. He also said, don't be afraid. The same God who said don't sin, said don't be afraid. The same God who said don't commit adultery, said don't be afraid. The same God who said don't commit murder, also said don't be afraid. Why is it we have put murder and adultery as sins and fear? Ah, that's a sort of a weakness. Why don't you call adultery also a weakness? It's not a weakness. If you commit adultery, you're disobeying God. And when you become afraid, you're disobeying God. Call it as disobedience and then you'll be delivered from it. Let me ask you a question. Supposing a man keeps on falling into adultery and says, Brother, that's just a weakness of mine. I mean, it's not a sin. It's just a sort of a weakness. It happens now and then. Do you think he'll ever get victory over it? You think a man who is a pickpocket um, and even after he's born again, he still goes around picking pockets and says, what to do? I mean, I'm just tempted when I get into the bus and I see that fellow's 
uh, that dumb guy standing in front of me, I just feel like picking his pocket. What to do? Uh, <laughs> do you think he'll ever get victory over it? He doesn't call it a sin. He calls it a weakness. And as long, listen to this, as long as you think fear is only a weakness, I prophesy you'll never get weakness. You'll never get victory over it. Till you call it a sin. Picking pockets, you tell that fellow, is a sin. No matter how much you are tempted with that fellow in the bus, don't pick his pocket. And no matter how much you are tempted to commit adultery, don't do it. And I say, how much you are tempted to fear, don't fear. That's what Jesus said. You say, Lord, but you got to help me. And I suppose like a man who is addicted to drinking or smoking, they need God's help to get rid of it. And you need God's help to get rid of fear. So I've explained to you the difference between caution and fear. Now I want to go one step further. I want to say that as long as we live, we will always have certain feelings of fear. I mean, if a cobra suddenly jumped out of this from under here somewhere, I would react. That's natural. That's a, that's a self-protective mechanism in our body and uh, I don't want to be act as if nothing is there. There is something there and I don't want to be anywhere near it. That, that's a sudden feeling of fear. That will always be there till the end of our life. That's how we protect ourselves. You know, suddenly you find a car coming in the road, you pull back. I mean, that's natural protective mechanism which we need. And also, <clears throat> supposing you suddenly Say tomorrow morning you hear some really bad news. That somebody's filed a criminal case against you. You've got to go to court tomorrow. Well, you're not going to be particularly excited and say, Hallelujah, that's great. Uh, you're going to have certain, Hey, what's this? What did I do? <laughs> and uh, you'll have certain fears. Now, what will I do? Whom do I, how do I get a lawyer? And what do I do next? That's natural because... It's like somebody pushing you into a river and you don't know how to swim. How will you feel if you don't know how to swim and somebody pushes you into a river? You'll naturally be scared. But after a while you learn how to swim and you become okay. So my point is this. <clears throat> there are certain feelings of fear that will come when you are encountering a new set of circumstances that you have never encountered before. I know there are a lot of young people who are perpetually afraid of getting married. Because they say, boy, what will marriage be like? I see all these horrible marriages around me and, and they're scared. And so they stay away from getting married because they're afraid. They've heard all these terrible stories of what happened to this person and that person and the other person. But there are a lot of good marriages too. So they sometimes they're just scared. And many, many things, any, any new area, like a person uh, who's always grown up in home and suddenly he has to go and live in a hostel in some other college far away and he's only 16, 17 years old. Naturally, he'll have a lot of fears. Those feelings are there. Don't worry about that. That's not sin. It's when you act on those feelings that it's dangerous. Supposing you say, no, 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 I'll never go outside my house or I'll never get married because I'm afraid. Then that can be a sin because you're acting on your fear. So I've discovered this. That as long as I live on the earth, there will be certain feelings of fear, particularly when we encounter some new situation that we have never encountered before. But you overcome it after some time because you get accustomed to it. So I'm not talking about those things. Don't worry about feelings. It is the decision you take which must decide that. I remember how the Lord taught me this many, many years ago when my children were small. And, um, you know, I used to travel for long weekends away to different parts of Tamil Nadu and all for meetings. And I remember once I was standing alone in Cantonment Station. I'd just taken an auto rickshaw and gone to the station to catch the train on Thursday or something like that. And my children were sick. And only my wife was at home, but the children were small. And while I, while I was stranding there in Cantonment Station, a certain fear came into my heart. What if my children's condition becomes worse? 
tomorrow. And I'm there and then I'll take another, I don't know when I'll get a reservation to come back. And it began to, you know, the more you meditate on it, you know how fear is, you begin to think about it more and it gets worse and worse and worse and you imagine all types of terrible things happening. Uh, well, all these things went through my mind and I was wondering, well, shall I just cancel my trip? I can send them a telegram and tell them I can't come and they'll understand uh, because my children are sick, I need to help. And as I was standing there, the Lord said to me, uh, you can go home if you like, this is okay. There's nothing wrong, but don't ever take a decision out of fear. Take a decision, but let your decision be a decision based on faith, not fear. And after you've used your common sense and exercised faith, you still feel, I think it's best I go home and help my wife look after my sick children. It's perfectly okay, the Lord said. But don't take that decision out of fear. That was a real help to me. I had feelings of fear. But I said, I'm not going to take a decision out of fear. I'm going to take a decision out of faith. I got into the train <laughs> and went for the meeting. Of course, all the hundred things the devil said would happen, none of them happened. And that's usually the case, you know. 99% of the things that you are afraid will happen usually never happen. The devil is just fooling you. I came back and my children were okay. So I learned something so many years ago that I've never forgotten. That feelings of fear may come, but if you don't act on that fear, you're okay. That's just temptation. But I say I'm not going to act on it. I'm going to act on the fact that I have a loving Heavenly Father. See. Along with fear is this insecurity that many, many believers have. A lot of problems that many believers have is because they are in this cage of insecurity. It's another word for fear. A cage of insecurity inside which I'm flapping my wings. And this insecurity is because I'm not sure how much God loves me. How much he cares for me. If I know the truth, what will the truth do? It will set me free. Like we see there, it will open the cage door and I'll be out. And so the devil makes sure that you don't know the truth. And I'm going to make sure that you know the truth. <laughs> uh, particularly concerning how much God loves us. It's one of my favorite topics because I know as a born-again Christian, as a young Christian, I was so insecure. I was fearful, insecure, and it brought me defeat in so many areas. But there was one truth, you've heard me say this many times, and I'll preach it as long as I live. The truth that set me free was John 17, 23. That the Father in heaven loved me as he loved Jesus. I never heard a message on that in my whole life. I never heard anybody preach on it. But it set me free so much that I've preached it everywhere I've gone. And my dear brothers and sisters, you've heard me speak it. You're probably in your head. I want to ask you whether you're gripped in your heart by this wonderful truth that God loves you as he loved Jesus. He cares for you as he cared for Jesus. He's interested in you as much as he was interested in Jesus when Jesus was living on the earth. Can you imagine how all of heaven was watching Jesus growing up in Nazareth? What he was doing? Every little thing. Was anybody trying to harm him? And when he grew up and went to preach in the synagogue and all those people ganged up and took him out to the cliff we read in Luke chapter 4 to throw him down the cliff and all of heaven was watching and the father was watching and he just arranged the circumstances in such a wonderful way that Jesus quietly escaped. This is the father who cares for you and for me. When people gang up against you in your place of work or in your college or anywhere in the world to harm you and they take you here or take you, maybe take you to the top of a cliff to throw you, throw you down 
Remember at that time, all of heaven is watching you. And it will not happen. Don't be afraid. Because your heavenly father cares for you. It's brought such tremendous comfort to me. You remember when uh, Jesus was that little baby in uh, wherever he was in Bethlehem and uh, Herod sent all his soldiers and said any child under two years kill them, kill them, kill them. And all of heaven was watching because Jesus was there little baby and just before the soldiers came they left for Egypt. Do you believe God protects you like that? He does. He does it even today. Some of the brothers here know how some of these religious cult people tried to come one day with all their false allegations to arrest me for saying that they were a cult. And the night before they came, I, I didn't know anything about it. I had already booked a train to travel to Tamil Nadu. And when they came, the bird had flown. He wasn't there. And they came with the police and everybody else to the gate and discovered that nobody's there. I was reminded of how the angel took Jesus away from Bethlehem to Egypt and Herod's soldiers were frustrated. They are frustrated even today. What I want to say is, it works. That's all I'm trying to say. If you can believe that God in heaven is watching all the time for you, especially for you, I believe it. I believe I am as important to heaven as Jesus Christ himself. You say, Brother Zach, you're pretty arrogant. I'm not. That's not arrogance. That's just faith. Sometimes you say, oh, I'm nobody. God doesn't care for me. That's not humility. That's unbelief. When God says, you are more precious than the apple of his eye. Do you know that the most sensitive part of your body is the apple of your eye? You can let it, people touch you anywhere in the body, it won't hurt you. But the moment anybody just touches that central part of your eye, even if it's your best friend, you react. You just don't want anybody touching the apple of your eye. And that's what God uses. Do you know this wonderful verse? Zechariah chapter 2. Zechariah chapter 2. You know where Zechariah is just after Hezekiah? Chapter 2, found it, second last book of the Old Testament. I was just testing your Bible knowledge. <laughs> Zechariah chapter 2, verse 8, the middle of the last part of that verse. He who touches you, touches the apple of God's eye. You say, I don't believe it. You don't believe it? According to your faith, be it unto you. You will not be the apple of his eye. I believe it. So according to my faith, it is unto me. You know who I am? The apple of Almighty God's eye. You better not touch me. I'll tell you that. I don't care who you are. You better not touch me because I won't do anything. When, you, when somebody touches your eye, the eye doesn't do anything. But boy, the hand does something. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm only the eye. I will not do anything. <laughs> you can try and touch me, but I've got some mighty arms around me. The arms of the Almighty God who will do something to you if you touch me. Or anybody touches me. The devil, demons, my enemies. Nobody can touch me. Why? Is it because I'm more important than you? No, not at all. It's because I believe what the Bible says. Perhaps you don't believe. Because in a false humility, you say, oh, no, 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 I'm not so important. And that's exactly what the devil wants you to say. I believe it. I believe what it says in John 17, 23, that the Father loves me as he loved Jesus. 
That's what drives fear out of our life. If anybody dares to touch me, he's touching the apple of God's eye. No demon can touch me. I don't live in fear of demons. No. Nobody can harm you. You know, I go to live, when I travel to some of these places in different parts of South India, sometimes uh, we have to stay in hotels. And I tell you, hotel rooms are demon-filled rooms. I've discovered that. <laughs> Believe it or not, I've seen it again and again that all types of evil goes on in those hotel rooms. Demons have been at work there for ages. And then I go there. And I can sense it. And I have to cleanse that room before I go to sleep. Before I get a peaceful sleep. I don't want any demon disturbing my sleep. I want to be fresh. And I've got to drive the demons out of that room. And say, there's a child of God come here. You better go. You can come back next week. Do what you like. But not as long as I'm here. I'm the apple of God's eye. Who Do you know who I am? And I tell you, every single case, every single time, the demons go and I can sleep peacefully at night. I need to sleep peacefully at night because I've got to be fresh for the next morning. And I don't want any demon disturbing me. No. Even if they don't harm me, I don't want them shaking my bed or any such thing. I want to sleep peacefully. So, what I want to say is, if you believe that you are precious in God's eyes, and you are, because how do we evaluate something? Supposing your house catches fire and you have got one minute to rush in and take something out before the house collapses. What will you take out? The old newspapers? <laughs> or that golden ring you have kept somewhere in some cupboard? Or some a wad of currency notes. You will go in and take the most valuable thing out, even if it's very small. Newspaper may be big, and this golden ring may be so small, but that's what you'll go and take. The value of an article is determined not by its size, but by what? Come on, all of you intelligent people. How much you paid for it, right? <laughs> right or wrong? How much you paid for it. That's what determines the value of an article. It's not a question of whether it's black or white or... No. How much did you pay for it? What's your value now? Tell me. In God's eyes. How much did God pay to create this universe? How much? All those who got mouths, tell me. <laughs> Nothing! How much did it cost God to purchase you? The blood of Jesus Christ, which Peter says is more than silver and gold. You're precious, brother, sister. If you didn't know it till today, you better know it today. It's not because you're such a clever, smart, handsome, good-looking person. No. You're pretty dumb and you may not be so good-looking, but it doesn't make a difference to God. The price he paid was the blood of his son. And that's what makes me precious in God's eyes. That's why he wrote my name in uh, his register in heaven. It's only precious things that you write over there. You know, like we read that whenever a man becomes a cabinet minister, he has to declare his assets. And he doesn't declare in his assets, I've got 25 old newspapers in my house. That's not assets. They'll say, don't make fun of us. Tell us what is valuable. I've got an old chair in my house. Come on, be serious. What are assets? Assets are not old chairs and old newspapers. Assets are things which are really valuable, which are to be written down. And I am one of God's assets. When God declared his assets way back before he created the earth, my name was there. You say, is it because you're special? No, it's because I believe God's word in Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 4, which says, He chose me before the foundation of the world. I just believe it. You know, it's, fe it's faith that drives out fear. Faith in the word of God, that God did choose me in Christ. 
And you say, well, but, but what, about, what about all the stupid things I did after that? Well, he knew that when he wrote my name down. Do you think God is surprised today? He said, oh, I didn't know that you would do such a terrible thing. You think God is ever surprised by anything I do or you do? He knew it before the foundation of the world. In fact, he knew all the stupid things I, I would ever do. I sometimes wonder why he chose me. <laughs> it's really amazing. I mean, how many husbands would still choose their wives if they knew in advance all the stupid things their wives are going to do? I think a lot of husbands would have, yeah, well, I'm not so sure whether I've chosen the same wife if I knew ahead of time all the stupid things and rebellion and or her stubbornness and all her anger. And if I knew all that, boy, I made a, might have made a different choice and probably got somebody worse. <laughs> don't, don't forget that. You would have probably chosen somebody worse. The grass on the other side always looks greener <laughs> till you actually start living there. And then you say, take me back to my old wife. That is the best. <laughs> so uh, please value your husbands and wives. It's the one God chose for you. But my point is this. Jesus chose us even though he knew every stupid thing that I'm going to do right up to the end of my life. And he still calls me the apple of his eye. See, this is the only way to be free from fear. To know the truth. And the devil is determined not to allow you to know the truth. He makes you condemn yourself for all the stupid things you did. It's almost as though Almighty God cannot forgive that. Or your sin is so terrible that even the blood of Christ cannot cleanse it. Which sin was that? Which sin is that which the blood of Christ cannot cleanse? Tell me. There is nothing. The blood of Christ cleansed all the wicked murders that thief on the cross did so thoroughly that next moment he was in heaven. Paradise. There's tremendous power in the blood of Christ. There's power in the blood of the Lamb, like we sing, to cleanse us so thoroughly that I'm valuable in God's eyes. We must know the truth, and the truth will set us free from all fear. But we need the Holy Spirit to fill us. Otherwise, you keep these truths in the head, and right now, all of you are free from fear, but wait till tomorrow morning, or wait till next week, and all the fears come back. That's why we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit who reminds us all the time, Hey, you're the apple of God's eye. Hey, your name was written before the foundations of the world. You're precious. You're valuable in God's eyes. And it's because I'm valuable in God's eyes that I don't want to sin. I'm precious. I mean, how many of you would throw around your valuable things here and there carelessly? How carefully we keep our valuables. We don't mind people stealing things which are not valuable, but valuable things we always keep under lock and key. That's how God keeps me, by the way. And that's how God keeps you. Because I'm one of those valuable assets he keeps very carefully. Because he paid such a tremendous price to purchase me. And that's why I'm not going to fool around with sin. I'm very precious. I've got to keep myself. So, let's remember what God's word says. Now I want to say something about the fear of Satan. It says in Hebrews chapter 2, we read that verse, that he came to deliver us from him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Many people are afraid of what Satan can do to them. Well, I want to tell you, there's absolutely nothing that Satan can do to you unless you move into his territory. See, supposing I if the government of Pakistan, for example, is determined to get me for some reason or the other because I discovered some secret of theirs or something like that. And the government of India gives me highest level of Z level category security. I'm safe as long as I live in India, right? But these black cat commandos who go around with me all the time they won't go with me if I go to Pakistan. They can't come there. You understand that? No, they can't come with me there. There if I go, they'll say, sorry, we can't protect you there. You stay here, we'll protect you. And I'm not telling stories. I've got somebody better than 
black cat commandos around me. You can't see them, but they're there. They are the angels of God, and they don't need any guns to protect me. They have protected me numerous times, especially on the roads, from accidents, and I'm sure they protected you too. I mean, <clears throat> they protected people like me who drive slowly, and people like you who drive fast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Whether we drive fast or slow, the angels have taken care of us, and we've got to really be thankful to them. They are better than black cat commanders. But if I move into the area called darkness, the angels say, we are angels of light. We can't protect you in darkness. That is how the devil gets some believers. They move into his territory. Now sometimes, accidentally, we may slip and go into darkness. You know what you should do? Jump out and come back. Supposing there is an, you know, the, the sewer line in Bangalore goes under the roads and sometimes they open it up for repair and supposing you are uh, walking carelessly and you slip into that manhole and fall right into the midst of uh, all this sewer flowing from so many houses and it's floating around you, what are you going to do? <laughs> How long are you going to live there? <laughs> I don't want to be there for one second. I want to scream and get out immediately. How many of you feel like that when you fall into sin? Any sin, anger, lust, bitterness, jealousy, it's a sewer. I tell you, it's worse than a sewer. I give you my word, I would rather fall into that sewer in Bangalore's under the roads than fall into sin. I hope you feel like that too. I want to get out immediately. And if I slip into darkness accidentally, I want to get out immediately. I say, I don't want to live there. I don't want to live there. Even for one second. And I repent and come back and the devil can't touch me. The reason, that is why I always tell people, please confess your sin immediately. Some people say, I wait till the end of the day and I confess all my sins at night before I go to bed. That's like the man who fell into the sewer at 7 o'clock in the morning and says, I'll, I've got the habit of settling these things at night before I go to bed. And he wallows around in that <laughs> till 9 o'clock at night and says, okay, now Lord, get me out of here. You're crazy. And if you fall into the sewer, get out immediately. That's like falling into sin. Get out immediately. Supposing you hurt somebody with an angry word. Maybe your wife or husband or father or mother, you said something rude. When are you going to apologize to her? When are you going to apologize to her? When are you going to get out of that sewer? You say, when I come back from the office. Really? Till then you'll float around with all this rubbish floating around you? Why, you got to be off your head. I want to get out immediately. Immediately confess before you go to work. Settle it. Because I don't want the devil to touch me. That's how we live without fear. There is no fear in the light. And I always want to walk in the light. That's why I always say, if you, if somebody has hurt you, now the other way around, you hurt somebody, you know how to deal with that. Now somebody hurt you with their words or their actions. And again you can fall into the sewer. What's the name of this sewer? An unforgiving spirit. A bitterness. That's another sewer. I don't want to live in an unforgiving spirit. There are people who have done all types of horrible things to me. But I tell you, I will not live in the sewer of an unforgiving spirit to any of them. I know they do things to me in order to push me into this sewer of an unforgiving attitude. I say sorry. <laughs> I'm not going to jump into the sewer of an unforgiving attitude no matter how hard you try to push me into it. Satan, I will forgive that person. I will release that person because this unforgiveness is a sewer into which I am not going to jump. How many of you recognize that? It's because you're not careful about these things. What is the result? Examine your own life so many times. 
You're afraid of that. Afraid of this. What will happen? Will I get, oh, this pain. Is it a cancer? Is it that? Is it the other thing? Oh, my finances are running down. What will happen next week? You know where all these fears come from? Because you are careless about living in darkness. Determined today that you will never live in darkness. You will always live in the light. And there is no fear there. You young people, determined from your youth that if you accidentally fall into the sewer, you're going to jump out immediately. If the moment you slip into darkness, it can happen. It can happen to me at my age. I immediately jump out. I don't want to live there for one second. I want to settle it immediately, get out. If a thought comes into my mind, which is not Christ-like, maybe a bitterness against somebody, I say, Lord, I don't want that sewer. I want to get out immediately. Please keep this attitude. And I tell you, not only you will live without fear, but the mighty power of God will be able to flow through you. Bless others. The anointing of God will rest upon you. God has not given us the spirit of timidity. And let me encourage the young brothers again. Don't be effeminate. Don't be women. Be bold. God's called you to be a leader. God's called you to go forth with his word. He says, as my father sent me, so send I you. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. Step out and do something for God and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? And when you do something, if it's wrong, God will show you it's wrong. But don't just sit there forever and ever and ever and ever doing nothing. May God deliver us all from the spirit of timidity and make us bold. And sisters also, you may not be called to be leaders, but I want to say in the new covenant, you're called to prophesy. According to Acts chapter 2 verse 17, all sisters can have the Holy Spirit poured out upon them that they can share God's word in a meeting to edify others. Yeah, why not? I, I'm sorry to say that some of our elder brothers and some of our churches haven't got light on that. When they have a prayer meeting, they won't even call the sisters, of course, because sisters can't, God doesn't listen to the prayer of sisters. What absolute, absolute garbage. Some of them can pray ten times better than the brothers. But we got all these crazy ideas in our head which have come from heathen culture, not from the Bible. Old covenant culture is what a lot of our churches are living under when it comes to the ministry of women and sisters. And I tell you, it takes a long time to get some of our elder brothers to be free from that heathen old covenant culture. Sisters, I want to encourage you to prophesy. The Bible says you can. Obey God's word. And in a spirit of meekness and gentleness, share what God has laid on your heart. Let's get the spirit of boldness in all of us and our churches will be much better in the days to come.